Thank you, Gatsby. So happens, I have a back throat. So I'm going to talk less and get you guys to talk some more about yourselves. One of the things we want to do is to talk about projects which you can execute through centers like the Tata Center. And you'll realize that one of the things we asked you to do was to indicate your research interests. Now, I've been through that and I get a feel for the kinds of things that you as engineers in your respective institutes are working on. But between now and Friday, we are going to work on two things. What is a more precise definition of what you want to work on in terms of innovation? Because you just put down the research interest, you didn't exactly tell us what specifically as a particular problem you could engage on. That's part one. And part two, how would you do that in association with us at the Tata Center? How are you going to take advantage of the fact that you are a TechWhip Institute, you are connected to IIT Bombay as a TechWhip Mentoring Institute, you are coming to us now in the Tata Center at IIT Bombay, right? And you cannot be saying that I am in general interested in quantum physics, because the Tata Center cannot help you with quantum physics. If you have got very specific problem definitions by the end of this week, then on Friday we discuss how to potentially take these things forward. So I'm going to start with a discussion of need finding and I'm going to differentiate how research gets done in need finding that's different from the mentality for conventional research. You've all gotten degrees, you've all done a thesis project of some kind and there were topics chosen which may or may not have been innovative in terms of the work that got done and there were constraints on how those topics were chosen and how you worked on those specific problems given resources, given knowledge, given time. But then how do you approach this problem as a genuine need that needs to be solved and do you then have the necessary training, skill sets, resources? So what does it take to solve an actual real world need? So we have been hearing about this bottom of the pyramid angle from two speakers now. So Marjani started this off in the morning. And then you had Parag come in and talk about solving problems for a larger number of people, not just solving problems for individuals, right? How do you work out what's a need that that larger community has? And this is something that even we at IIT had to struggle to understand better. And that's primarily because our definition of problems is what you find in textbooks. There's a problem, there's a solution. The problem is something somebody gives you to try and solve and you start engaging in this under the impression that the guy who gave you the problem already knows the solution, he's just testing you out, which happens in exams. Sometimes it happens with even thesis research where the supervisor might already kind of know where things are going and the expectation is as a student you will find out on your own. But with many of the things that we are talking about with bottom of the pyramid, and that to the social sectors that, for example, the Tata Center is interested in, energy, water, healthcare, education, housing, they are very hard problems, very hard problems and they are not so easily solved. If they could have been solved, they would probably have been solved by now. The fact that they are not being solved implies they are hard problems. So what about them makes them so hard that the conventional training we get in terms of problem solving, which is what, for example, we all go through when we do engineering coursework, problems at the end of a chapter, solutions at the end of the book. It's a matter for you to learn how to find those solutions, but the solutions are already there, somebody solved them, put them in a book. Except that now in the real world, we're looking at problems with no solutions known. Right? So how do we find the needs? How do we find the solutions to these needs. So I'm going to spend some time talking about need finding, less about innovation. And you're going to hear this as a theme all the time because we are in a hurry to get into a lab to prove that we know how to engineer solutions. We are never in a hurry to ask what is the real problem that's important to solve. 
So, need finding it turns out is something engineers in particular find very hard because we do not have the training to go out and find a problem. Why? Because in an entire schooling, whether it is school or college afterwards, somebody has given us problems. We never went through a process of figuring out what that problem was which needed solving. This is why this is one of the more critical aspects of innovation, which is if you have made the mistake of starting to work on the wrong problem, your solution is probably going to be useful maybe to few people, but not to society at large. And before you jump into a lab and try to build a solution, you ought to be spending time trying to figure out what the actual need that society has and then what do I sit and engineer. This does not happen and if you look around you, this has not happened. This has not happened when you went through a degree of some kind on a degree project. This has not happened to your batchmates. This has not happened to your seniors. Why does it not happen? So, can you give me some reasons, some insights as to why it is hard to solve a real problem? Just give me some ideas from your background, your context as to why you believe that some of these societal problems are turning out to be hard to solve. Well, uh, we don't get a good uh, communication with it. We don't get a group, good group to discuss the problem. Okay. Okay. Why do you need a group to discuss the problem? Uh, <coughs> at least it's a problem like what is the size of the problem or would it matter a lot or not or it's a decision that we are thinking. So who's who's got to be in your group? So, if you are waiting for somebody else to give you this insight, who is this who is going to have this insight who needs to be in your group? No, but who is that? What kind of people do you want in your group? We went back to saying that you should have a supervisor who knows what is going on, even if you are a student who does not know what is going on. That is not true. If the supervisor knew what needed to be solved, maybe you would have attempted to solve it. So just going to a boss who is maybe technically more aware than you, would, they, would such a person be able to solve, for example, a housing problem? Which domain did you say you were in? Which department? Are you? Computer engineering. So let's say we are looking at some kind of um, microfinance solution where the idea is to quickly generate some transactions for people, small loans, microfinance or so small loan, people need small loan. You can immediately see this is an IT solution, and very quickly I will have to leverage some kind of online transaction system to push money digitally, ok. So, the security involved, but what does it take? What group of people do you need to sit and discuss with to figure out what exactly needs to be done, so that a farmer in a village next to you can get a loan. In 20 minutes because that is the way it is. Unless they get that loan to buy, let us say, seeds on that particular day, it is pointless, right? And they cannot be spending half a day or a day in a branch of a bank with documents trying to negotiate a loan. So, this has to happen fast, it has to happen digitally, agreed? Now, who do you need to talk to? How do you figure out what the need is? Anybody else? Nothing wrong with that. We all have degrees and we are I'm here because I have a degree. But again, that is nothing wrong. Okay. So, I want I want you to all be clear. We are talking about innovation, but there is no contradiction with getting a degree. Right, because the PhD, for example, and I got a PhD in chemical engineering, all it proved is not that I am an expert in chemical engineering, it proved that I was capable of doing some independent work with maybe some assistance from a supervisor, maybe a committee member. But it proved I could run a lab project independently, that is all. It is a certificate which says I am capable of running an independent research program. So, when somebody hires me, the assumption is I can now create my own independent research program. Not be true, but that is the assumption. That is all it is. 
it does not say that I worked on a relevant problem. So, the PhD is just a learning curve and you are trained invariably in a good system, you are trained to be hired by somebody who will make better use of you than the university itself. Okay. Typically, PhDs are appointed by bigger corporates which then generate technologies because now you know how to do research and you will not take 5 years again to learn how to do research in that company, you will do it very quickly in one year. Yeah, you So, what is this now? So, again, see, he is talking about wanting to talk to a number of people to identify a need. You going up and down, you seem to have observed a need. How do I know that is the correct need? How do I know that is the correct need? You have seen. Yeah. Is there a risk that you are biased in what you are seeing? Yes. It's okay. happened. It's happened. My 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 father also because he is father is a farmer. He's been struggling with pumps. Maybe he's been struggling to uh, irrigate his land. Still, there is a canal in my village, but they are not using the proper using this uh, uh, water, and they still use using. Right. So one is biased, but so the, where I'm going with this is how do I know it's the real need? Really, you and really your father for sure struggled. No, no, no. Real is it that the water conservation basically this. Uh, the, uh, we can manage this water, uh, the needs of water as like as Israel is facing this water crisis. We can we can no. sustain this. Theori water. Theoretically, that's fine. I yeah. don't have an argument yeah. against what you're saying. What so, I'm where I'm going with this is finally we're expecting somebody to work on this problem, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which implies that you are now working on a need yeah. which impacts a large number of people. Yeah, yeah. And how do I know that your problem is something which impacts a large number of people? Therefore, that it deserves to be worked on. Maybe it impacts just you. No, it's a, it's a villagers, farmers, what I am saying. No, but that's you saying that. How do I know? How do I know that it's a widespread problem? And it goes back to what is this group of people yes, yes. who end up saying that this is such a big need that really ought to all stop everything else and deal with it. Regarding what? Status of the different okay, fine. So, there are agencies like branches of the government which set up surveys which review what is going on. By the way, who should have solved this problem of irrigation? Government or Tata Center at IIT Bombay? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. How come the government did not solve it? Maybe lake, lack of. They are all very different things you are saying. Awareness is different from policy, is different from ideas. willpower or ideas. They are all very different, right? Funds, really? You think? Okay. Uh -huh. Sure. See, we are jumping the gun, but while my focus is on trying to figure out a need, I want to point out that some of you are already talking solutions. Right? There is a problem there. Because the moment you say that you are going to try out a particular solution, you have already made up your mind what needs to be done. When I am open to the fact that I might have gotten my definition of the problem itself potentially wrong. And the reason we are in a hurry to try out a solution is because we are engineers. We are supposed to solve. We are supposed to demonstrate our knowledge, for example, of drip irrigation and our ability to put together a quick low cost system for drip irrigation. But maybe it is the wrong solution. Right? So, this business of need finding is actually something which, strictly speaking, does not involve talking about a solution at all. 
And by the way, at this point, hopefully you're realizing that I'm using the phrase neat finding all the time. I'm not calling it a problem. Okay, what's the distinction between a need and a problem? A failed need is a problem. Sure. Right? So, what's the difference between a need and a problem? Okay. And problem? The basic facility of Rupi Kapra Makhan type things. The basic needs. Sure. There could also be problems. Struggling since independence. It maybe, maybe, but there are there problems or are there needs? Yeah. That's a problem. Okay, very good. Yeah. Sir, uh, by in the in the process of our satisfying our needs, uh -huh. uh, by suppose we are using suppose farmers are using this uh, chemicals, uh, uh -huh. all the things. Uh -huh. So the problem is that the bio remediation and bio accumulation accumulation that disturb the balance between this environment and human being. Uh -huh. So suppose we want to uh, counter these problems, so we have to use organic farming. So the problem see, is. You're getting into solutions. I'm not no, even talking solutions. See, see, organic farming, but the uh, farmers are still not uh, getting this. Don't again. See, one, there's a reason why I'm stopping at this point, and I'm trying to get a point across very clearly. Don't bring solutions into a discussion of a need. Don't force fit a solution yet. There's time. Yes, yes, yes. That is what we'll spend all our time on later on building a solution. But unless you have clarity about what you are trying to do and how you're going to go about it, it's kind of useless. All that energy is going to be wasted. Ultimately, money is going to be wasted. So in that sense, what's the need? Okay, and what, what is the problem? So the distinction I would make, and I don't have a great definition either. I'm asking a question, but I don't have a great answer either. The distinction is this. Okay, I'm trying to use the word need simply to break away from the fact that when we talk problems, these are textbook problems, which have textbook solutions. And we're working on things which don't have such easy definitions as problems, which have easy, therefore, procedures for solutions. A need, okay, like you're talking of the basic needs, which we have not had since independence, can in turn be broken down into multiple technical problems. There could be many things, okay, you're talking about water availability, it could be about better pumps, it could be about better access to power, it could be about solar solutions, multiple technical things, each of which then becomes some target technical specification against which you will then build a solution, right? So need I can break down into multiple things. So it's remember, it's not enough to just say that I've built a better pump. How do people even know of the existence of the pump? So you're going to have to deal with some awareness, some marketing. Now marketing becomes a technical challenge of some kind. It's a problem of awareness which then has to be addressed using a custom made marketing strategy of some kind to make farmers aware. So this business of finally getting water to all farmers in a given district involves some engineering, maybe a better pump, which is able to function with limited access to power, so maybe a solar angle to it. You need to figure out a way to make people aware of this solution, marketing, awareness, training. You need to find a way to get people to have finance to even purchase these solutions. So microfinance maybe, again, that's another technical challenge. And between all these problems, you will finally address a need in solving all these problems. So that's the way I prefer to differentiate a need, which is a very top level statement of what you need solved from the problems where we are so used to thinking of problems as very technical statements, which then can be systematically addressed. Fair? Because we are not trained currently as engineers to address whole needs at one shot. We tend to break it down. We tend to break it down into small technical projects which we can execute in our labs. And that's what you did for your master's project for your PhD projects. You had constraints. 
What are the constraints when you did a project in your lab? What are the constraints? Some infrastructure is missing. What else? Uh, maybe your test case is not very well. Okay, so you are working on some simulated system, not a real world system. What else? Funding could be an issue. Was time an issue? No. You could work on this indefinitely. You had to get out of your lab, you would get booted out, your stipend would stop, something would happen. No? So, time was an issue. What else? So, all of these were problems, which meant what? Which meant that when you exited with a degree and therefore a thesis project, what did the thesis project achieve? There was a point made earlier that it is get, getting you a degree and the degree is important because it then gets you into a place that is why you are now appointed in your various colleges, right. But what did it prove? Did it prove that you are a master of that particular technology? Did you get there? No, because you worked on something abstract, you did not work on the real problem. Did you figure out the real need? How much time did you have to spend on figuring out which problem to solve in your thesis projects? How much time did you spend on it? Or were you given these topics by somebody? How did it work in your case? You are given some supervisor, you walk into somebody's lab, you want to do a project with you, and the next minute you are given a topic, that is it. Right? How do you know that was a topic to work on? Or did you not care because you did not have a choice? Most of us did not have a choice. You and I did not have a choice. You know, because I preferred to join one particular individual is true. Moral of that is that okay, most of us have gotten training on how to start given a problem statement, trying to take it forward, trying to get some understanding about the system. But very few of us have had access to figuring out what is the relevant problem statement to work on in the first place. Why is it that we do not have that access? Because again, we do not have funding, we do not have unlimited time okay. and in some cases we do not even have access to the group, the stakeholders, the stakeholders who can give you some insight into what is going on. And if you are talking about farming, the stakeholders are not engineers, right. So that conversation you need to have with a bunch of farmers who need to figure out what they need in terms of pumping requirements. For example, somebody needs to activate their pumps middle of the night because that is when the power supply switches on. They have different challenges as to how that technology must be deployed. Whatever power they have must be storable so that they can then access it in the middle of the night. That is a different challenge than somebody who can do it in the middle of the day. Do you see that? So, by and large, therefore, it turns out many, many of us are working on such abstract problems either because it is the simple thing to do in a lab so that you can get your degree and get out in a defined period of time. It is the least risky thing to do. Risk. Innovation and risk. Okay. So let me tell you a fundamental truth, uh, truth about how most research works, whether it is scientific or engineering research. There are agencies like DST and DBT in the country which fund research. This is MHRD, and you know, depending on your particular discipline, there may be other government departments typically which will fund. Are you aware of what the funding cycle is? How long a funded project is granted for? Three years. Typically, it's three years. Why? Because it seems to imply that the fundamental unit for how long a project would take to solve is three years. That's an that's an implication. Okay, somebody has already decided this three years. That three years also has a finance angle. Accounts in the government will therefore keep a project account active for 3 years. What else? Okay. So, if you are looking at a 3 year cycle for a particular funded project, okay, what was the government trying to do with the project sanction for 3 years? Are we saying that we will solve a fundamental problem in terms of a need finding solution in 3 years? How long did it take you to get your degrees? 
how come it, therefore the government is not giving you funding for four years? On average, there was, so there's uh, some logic, right? So there's pressure on you to get something done within three years. What happens at the end of the third year? Project ends. If the money is not spent, you give it back to the government. What happens to you guys? What happens to that particular project that you worked on? It just shuts down. Right? Now, if you know that this is what's going to happen to you, which kind of project are you going to work on? An innovative project or what's called an incremental project, where you're looking at taking something already solved, you're going to make one small change to it, and you're now going to try to solve it with that small change. Which one are you going to do? The incremental project. What was this then? This is risk avoidance at all levels. Why do the government give grants for three years? Because it's basically saying, look, if you give money to people who are going to claim that they're going to innovate, and you give them money, like indefinite amount of money for any period of time, and you expect innovations to happen, the odds are innovations will not happen. And that government secretary, who finally has to go back to parliament and report on the number of innovations which happened, number of technologies which were transferred, number of patents which were filed, will have nothing to report. They are going to look stupid. Right? So therefore, what do they do? They say, let's make sure that we run schemes in three years. In three years, what are we going to demand that the person who has gotten a grant comes up with? What do you do? What is the ex expectation? Write a paper, write maybe two papers. Then you start counting all the papers that have been published between all the people who got the grants, report that back to parliament. That's your accomplishment. But now, the benchmark of success of research is what? Is no longer the number of innovations which actually go out to society. The benchmark has become the number of publications. And you're all part of this game now. Right? Now, that's an easy threshold to meet. To push people to write papers is relatively easy. And for people to write papers is also relatively easy. So what happened? The official lowered risk his risk, he has to go back and not look stupid in front of a subcommittee in parliament. You as an investigator also reduced your risk because you said, look, I need a sum of money to do some work and I am going to take this sum of money to do something incremental. If I open my mouth and promise something great and I do not deliver, then I am going to look really stupid and I will cut off my funding in future. So therefore, I am better off doing something incremental. What about the student in your lab? As a student, would you like to join somebody's lab when, where there is a possibility that you will do something totally game-changing, innovative research? Or would you join somebody's lab where you are guaranteed that you can get out in three years? Okay. Obviously, the one where you are going to get out in three years. That is also a question of reducing risk. So, the core of it, all I am trying to point out to you is that innovation and risk go hand in hand and essentially you are fighting a system which is not geared towards promoting innovation. Not that it is not geared, that maybe this is a strong way to put it, it does not incentivize, it does not incentivize innovation, which means you have to find your own incentives. Now that is a funny thing to tell you when you have walked into a workshop on innovation, to tell you that it is a difficult thing to innovate, but there are ways to do it. And one of the things I wanted to pay attention to over the next few days is how the Tata Center functions as an entity in IIT Bombay. Because remember, IIT Bombay has to live by the same rules as other institutes. So when it comes to three-year funding cycles, same thing. When it comes to students preferring safe kinds of projects, same thing. Right? So how do you get innovation done? So pay attention to different elements in, in the story as I go along. Some of these we have already mentioned, for example, the need to talk to a bunch of people to find out what is a good problem statement. The need to draw from your own experience to figure out what is a problem area where you want to venture into. Okay. We have been hosting some student innovation <laughs> hackathons and uh, funding challenges of late, including one by the Tatas themselves. And the team which won an award last year involved a student 
basically a young kid wanting to build artificial limbs for people, low cost artificial limbs. That's, that's the team which won a prize. The reason the guy is building this is not because he's learning something in mechanical engineering or robotics or whatever. He's interested in this because his mother lost her arm. It's a personal problem. What's very interesting is as a team, okay, he went out. He doesn't have the technical skill. He went out and he found people with their technical skills. So that's lesson number one in some ways, which is innovation involves you asking who's relevant to my whole discussion. Will you be part of my team? Now that's another interesting thing. If you look back to the way you've done research conventionally, you've all done research in departments where people around you are like you. Now that helps you get out in three years because you take advantage of some seniors know-how in terms of methodology and you do things and you get out very quickly. Right? But the penalty is that, however, you are not seeing diversity in terms of knowledge. You are all clones of each other. Oh. So, the investigators lab, then more or less all of you are very similar to each other. Which becomes a problem when you try to go out and try to learn something new. Because you have not been exposed to diversity. So at the outset itself, a recommendation I would make is because you are all relatively young faculty, new to academic careers and possibly to the innovation game as well. One of the biggest and best things you will do for yourself is to interact with people from different departments including, including the non-engineering departments, especially the humanities. The reason I say this is because a lot of why we struggle to figure out how our technology is usefully used is because we don't appreciate how to deal with society. We don't appreciate how to model society. There are no easy engineering models for this. In fact, all of these are taught under the humanities as skills which involve you as, an, as a researcher. For example, a social science researcher is expected to go into the field and figure out how to live with those people and understand from that process what's going on. Why? Because those people are probably not capable of giving you a technical summary of what their needs are. And for you to abstract that out is not something engineers have ever been taught. There is no formula for this. Right? So it is important that therefore some time be spent talking with each other. You will realize that you all immediately as you came into this room, you sat as colleagues from the same institute. So you are comfortable with each other. Break that. Interact with each other. Understand each other's interests. And the same thing once you go back to your colleagues. Yes, you'll do your own research program. Yes, you'll live with your colleagues in your department all the time. But if you're going to do true innovative research, you're going to form teams, especially of people with other departments, because you don't need people of yourself. Think of that undergraduate lab experiment, which I'm sure most of you now are forced into running, right? UG labs. How many, what is your batch size in a UG lab experiment? No, what is, what is the batch per? 20 at a rig. At, at some level, yeah. Five, five, okay. So if five, six people are doing the same experiment at one time, how many people are actually doing the experiment? Okay. So what are the others doing? That's, that's exactly what's going to happen in innovation. There are four or five people with the same skill sets trying to talk the same thing. They are all at the same level. They all will have the same idea. They will all run out of the run out of ideas at the same time. And unless you have diversity in your team, you are not going to move forward. Okay? So, go, get to the slides, but hopefully you appreciate that at this point need and need finding and need finding by talking to a relevant set of people is critical. This business of innovation and I did have a few slides on the statistics of innovation, but Parag has already talked about it. So, I am going to skip some of these slides as we move along. The business of innovation depends on where you are aiming at. Are you going to do incremental innovation? Are you going to do something grand? And that grand innovation is called blue ocean. So, an example of blue ocean innovation is the smartphone. 
before Apple came along and figured out how to use a touch screen to interact with a portable device. Nokia existed. Do you remember Nokia? Got wiped out. Because they didn't innovate on this front. It's coming back now, fully. But it got wiped out overnight. But that sort of innovation is hard. And that sort of innovation, as Parag pointed out with that slide on Samsung, involves a huge budget to execute. It occurs rarely. So th that's where you'd like to be, because if you get in there and you get in at the right time, you make a killing. But it turns out we don't need to be in there. You can try incremental stuff, but you can try it in a new context. You can try it in a totally new way of delivering something as a context. For example, when I talked about loans to farmers, leveraging IT to give a loan to a farmer in 20 minutes is a game changer in the country if it can happen. Now, why, why do we have such systems? Because if you know what's going on with, forget farmers, if you talk of any vendor, street side vendor, the guy has to go to the wholesale market, buy his vegetables, put them on a cart and then go around trying to sell it, right? But to buy his stuff from the wholesaler, he needed money. Where does he get the money? He takes a loan from a money lender at a ridiculous rate. Not from a bank, because the bank will never not a normal bank will not give you money at such a small scale. It's not worth it for the bank in terms of humans carrying out a transaction in a branch. It takes too long, too expensive. You look at the branch manager's time spent on this. So it doesn't happen. So the guy therefore ends up with a money lender who takes a lot of money. And you have to therefore spend a lot of effort going around selling your stuff so that in the evening you can repay the money lender. And hopefully you make some profit after all that. Right? So what therefore do you need to be doing? There's a need there. Somebody needs money very quickly. Few questions asked. There's a technical challenge. What's the challenge here? This person has no credit history. All you guys know, now that you have jobs, you will probably be getting emails in your mailbox every day asking you to get a new credit card, offering you a new credit card or even offering you loans. But you don't need a loan. It's that guy who needs a loan. And he can't get a loan. You see that? So how do you provide him a service? How do you do it and you be profitable at the end of the day? That's also a challenge. You're not doing it just for charity. How do you do it and be sustainable? Okay. So at the end of the day, who's your stakeholder? And how do you offer them innovation and value? So one of the things that in, invariably has happened in this space of innovation is a bunch of us, especially engineers saying, we know what's going on for you. We will build a device and solve your problem. We will build it and give it to you and your life will be nice and peaceful from now on. And it's not work. If you look around in any village these days, so many prototypes, engineering prototypes, which are just broken down, rusted, sitting around, right? Walk, walk through, walk through hospitals and see the number of diagnostic devices, for example, which have been designed and built in top institutes, including abroad. So what's missing? People are innovating. Somebody is coming up with some gadget. What's missing? Why is it not working? Because you didn't design for that particular context. You didn't understand what these people needed. You simply assume that if you build a gadget and drop it there, problem solved. But maybe the problem is not solved. Maybe there's a problem of financing. Maybe there's a problem of distribution. Maybe there's a problem of maintenance. If the device breaks down the first time, who's going to fix it in a remote location? You didn't deal with all of that. You simply built a gadget and dropped it there. So what's that entire system which needs to be designed? to take care of that need, which is where again I differentiate a need from a problem. The problem would have been maybe for example build a medical device to do XYZ, but that is not necessarily solving the need in a sustainable fashion. So what are the various elements therefore you need? So the stakeholder should find value in it. So just because something is for example been built by an IIT Bombay, doesn't mean somebody in a village should pay money for it and buy it. Okay. So, what is the value for them? 
So, because I deal with healthcare, one of the challenges you've had is, where would you innovate in healthcare? What should you innovate for in healthcare if you want to change the healthcare system? And this is a slide just to provoke. Because the first thing that most people have as an opinion, if you want to innovate in healthcare, is do something which will be a new gadget in a hospital, a new technology in a hospital, which will either diagnose better or will cure somebody faster or cheaper. Design typically for a hospital. Because that's where we all experience our healthcare. Think about it. Your connection with healthcare is typically a hospital. That too, when an emergency has happened. We are not a culture which likes to just randomly walk into a hospital and do a healthcare checkup just for the sake of figuring out if you are okay. We don't. We don't spend our money on healthcare. Right? Less than 10% of our population is insured. Life or general health. Which means most people invest in healthcare in an emergency room intervention of some kind. That's our first point of contact with an expert. And therefore, if you're looking for some technology development or expertise, typically we say, let's deal with it here. When a complete healthcare system involves this, so what do I mean by this? Assessment. What's assessment? If I simply knew from year to year what are people dying from? and where they are dying from, where they are dying of a particular disease. In theory, the government has enough money to deal with this. For example, the city of Mumbai, we know how many people will die of malaria and dengue year after year. And where in the city of Mumbai this predominantly happens. Which in theory means the municipality can go out and do some defogging exercises, right? Where you do some fumigation. On mosquito control in theory. So if you had access to data and you collected data systematically, you could deal with the problem because you now know how to deploy your resources. This is actually, if you were a company, like you were a logistics company, take Flipkart, you would be really interested in knowing where are all your parcels at any point in time and where are all your delivery boys at any point in time. You'd want to know that. Where is the question of profit? And if the government were to think of this as a profit making thing, you would want to know where do I invest all the money, taxpayers money in dealing with people's health to keep them healthy. Right? So there is that. Then there is prevention. So no brainer, if you cut out tobacco use in the country, the number of oral cancer cases is going to go down tremendously. So that disease, for example, can be controlled entirely by prevention. If you control mosquito levels, you would control a range of infectious diseases, primarily malaria and dengue, but others as well. If you control the quality of water, you would control a whole bunch of other infectious diseases. Right? Prevention. Why do I say that? Because the amount of money that you would spend on prevention would always be smaller in the amount of money that you would need to spend on a government healthcare system afterwards, hospitals and doctors and so on. So again, it's, if you look at an overall process optimization problem, prevention would be cheaper always for society. Right? Diagnosis. If I knew in advance what you are tending towards in terms of bad health, I will let you know. When you walk to, if you have gone to a doctor, and you have gone to a general practitioner, not an expert. If you go to a general practitioner, like a family doctor, what measurements does the family doctor make of you? you measure your BP, maybe. Sugar levels, maybe. Sugar is rare. Hmm? Sugar measures on portable, portable device, but that's also rare. Not everyone randomly does it. So, no measurements. So, we don't know the state of your health. Where do you go to when you want to figure out the actual state of health? You go to a specialist finally. Notice that your frontline fellow doesn't even do an ECG to figure out if your heart's okay. Right? So we don't have that system of diagnostic. When if I could come up with a low cheap diagnostic that I could keep in a doctor's office, in theory I can find out cases before they escalate. 
If my ECG starts looking funny, I take you aside and told go meet a cardiologist before the heart attack happens, before you need surgery, before you need a stent. And look at the cost of a procedure afterwards versus the cost of a diagnostic. Okay. We also do not have anything to deal with recovery. So, after your surgery, hospital throws you out. Why? Economics. That bed has to be freed up for the next patient because that is when the money is to be made. You make more money on surgeries than on monitoring you and doing the occasional ward visit. So, it's, do not treat the hospital like a hotel. Okay, procedure, go out and so on. Right? And we barely have enough emphasis on this. So, if you think about it in healthcare, our entire system is focused on just the hospital system which is exactly wrong. Okay. Now, I say this because if you do a systematic analysis in whichever sector you are in, and this is healthcare, but you could do this for energy, you could do this for water, education, whatever it is. You then ask the question, how do I change a system which is currently focused on this into this? How do I change a system which is currently focused on this into providing options for this? For example, if I can come up with competent nursing care at home, which ties up with the hospital, is that not an opportunity to make money? Right now, for example, if your kidneys are failing, you have to go all the way to a dialysis center for kidney dialysis, which is not fun if you are a patient, because you are obviously in very bad health if you need dialysis. Right? So, to travel, to travel on Mumbai roads, for example, impossible. What if the dialysis care comes to you? Is there an opportunity there? Is there a need for home dialysis care? The answer is yes. So, in our entire population, is there a fraction of the population which would pay for it? So, maybe not everyone. Villagers may not be able to pay. There are challenges. What are the technical challenges? In fact, there was a need and there are problems now. So, the need was home dialysis care. What are the problems? How do I come up with a dialysis machine which is portable, which I can take up a staircase and bring to your home? That is one technical challenge. How do I come up with good quality water to dialyze against purified RO water, sterile RO water? So, how do I do I purify the water and lug it all the way to your home, or do I start with your tap water and then purify it on the spot? We'll do it on the spot, but then you need a technology for that. You see that? Where do I get all the consumables, the connections, the plumbing? I have to connect all of this up to the body. How do I do it? How do I monitor your health? What measurements should I make of you? Because you are not coming to the clinic anymore. So, I have to collect measurements at home. What measurements should I make? These all become technical problems. And then there are business level models. What is in it? Who is this technician who is going up and down? Or this nurse who is going up and down? Who certifies this nurse? Yes, because we created a gadget, doesn't mean I can go and pretend to be a dialysis technician. Somebody, some medical college has to now certify this nurse. Who is that? In other words, who defines policy things and agrees that this model might work? But that's a way to think. Okay? How do you start somewhere and say this is where it's currently happening? How do I shift it somewhere else? How do I shift it somewhere else? And how do I shift it somewhere else so that ultimately it is a profitable model? It need not be profitable on day one. It need not be profitable on day one because there is always going to be, for example, investors are worried that just because you are offering home care dialysis that it is not safe. So, we are worried about safety. They say we therefore do not want to invest. But supposing I take some grant, some donation and I prove the model. I prove what? I prove in a clinical trial that home dialysis care is as good as going to a clinic. And if I can get the top nephrologist to say that it turned out to be the same. The person sitting at home got the same quality of care as they got in a clinic. At this point, what do you prove? You prove that home dialysis care should happen. And now the question is, how do I get a business investor interested in this? But till that point, the business investor is not going to be too too concerned about what you are trying out because they will say it is a risky strategy. 
So how do you do the engineering and bring it to the point where you now say it's a viable business model? If you look at where innovations are happening, people are building gadgets, but without thought as to how they're going to get deployed. Who's going to handle a gadget? Who's going to go to your house and make measurements? Right? Now, there are some gadgets, for example, in healthcare where you just build so that you can strap on and you can get some measurements. And ECG is just strapped on. But notice, even in ECG, there's nobody who comes home and does an ECG for you. Okay? So how do you get this done in an interior location? Okay? In India, we're essentially focused on innovation, not in a technological sense. We've asked you, where is the innovation happening? The innovation has happened in business models like what Narayana Sridhar has done or Arvind Daikar has done or LV Prasad I Institute in Hyderabad has done. And what, what was their business model? They said that instead of focusing as a multi-specialty hospital, let's focus on one disease or one category of diseases. So Arvind Daikar does on the eye care. Right? Now, what's the logic of that? This goes back to the assembly line idea. If you have an assembly line operation, your costs go down, right? So you have people who are dedicated staff members in a hospital, including nurses, who are dealing only with very specific okay, diseases. So the nurse, for example, in an eye, uh, eye care institute is probably, probably more knowledgeable than doctors in a general purpose hospital. Because they are seeing thousands of patients all the time and they know what they are doing. And they are doing one task repeatedly and they are doing it very, very well. In Narana Hridalaya, probably familiar with De Devi Shetty, the surgeon, cardiac surgeon. So the cardiac surgeon spends time only cutting open arteries and stitching them together again, the bypass. He doesn't waste his time opening up a patient, closing up the patient, doing anything else. There are lots of other doctors doing it. There are nurses also assisting in doing that. So everyone is given a specific task. Okay. And notice that everyone is given a set of tasks so that they are all moving, like in the assembly line, so that the assembly line is moving at a constant rate. There is no one bottleneck. So they actually figure it out process wise. So it is a process optimization innovation that they have done in terms of business models. Now the other thing that incidentally happens is if you start focusing on only one disease and one condition, for example, Nara and Hidayala, they will be the biggest users of stents. Which means you will do a bulk negotiation with some vendor and say, give me the cheapest rate for stents, which they pass on to the patient. So the patient curiously gets a lower cost procedure done, but you are getting it from a higher skilled doctor. Why is this person higher skilled? Because they are performing hundreds of procedures all the time. In fact, I do not know if you know this now, students from Harvard Medical School and other top medical colleges in the UK come to India to learn. Some of them, of them, of them are there in Mumbai right now. Why? Because our doctors are better trained. So the sheer patient loads we have to handle. Right? So the skill levels are very, very high. And we have also learned how to do things in constrained settings. So the question is, given that these Resources are there, how do you convert it into a business model? So, what are Devi Shetty realizes, and this didn't happen long ago, it happened in the late 1990s, that's when the chain of hospitals started. If you start paying attention, you realize that every disease, more or less, a specialty hospital is coming up with a disease. There are hospitals now for pregnancy and prenatal care, eye disease, as I said, okay, cardiac conditions, just specialized, that's the way it's going, it's fragmenting. So, the multi specialty hospital notion. Is breaking down. That's an innovation. That's a game changer. The problem, however, is that patient now has to travel all the way to get to that specialized center. Right? So it's not solving a certain issue, which is care is not still coming to that village and you're waiting for a problem to arise before you go to that hospital. The expectation is you still find your way to the hospital, which doesn't solve the problem for most of the people in our country. So how do you innovate for that situation? How do you push this? into a village. Okay. What I need you to do with what you put up as your research interest is to spend time on the slide. I want you to, don't just talk about an engineering statement of interest. 
talk about it in the context of a bottom of the pyramid stakeholder. Identify why that work that you're planning on doing is important for a stakeholder. But at the same time, talk about why it's important to an investor. And unless you do both, you're going to have a problem. Why? Remember, you're the person in between somebody who has a need. You're the guy innovating. You're in between somebody who has a need and somebody who's going to find a biotechnology from a market shelf. Right? So the assumption is you will do the research and you will commercialize your research. For you to commercialize and put it on the market, some investor must find it useful. So therefore, when you draft a problem definition, a need definition, two sets of people must be able to understand what you're trying to say. On the one hand, the stakeholder who has a problem, they must understand this. At the other extreme, the investor who's going to probably invest in this later on, they must understand it. And you must be clear in your minds early on at about both ends of the spectrum. You can't say that I will build a solution and then try to shop around for an investor later. Because usually that such an investor may not exist. So two things go hand in hand. Who is it that's a, who is a potential investor? And in some of these, the investors are unusual. Okay, if I'm going to try to build, for example, a solution for a village, a healthcare solution for a village, villager, your multinational medical companies are not investors. They don't care. A G, a Philips, Siemens, they don't care about villages. They would rather sell you MRI machines, CT scanners, even ECG machines. Why? Because a bigger profits to be made selling these to urban hospitals. Profits made selling it, profits also made maintaining these equipments because they will get you into maintenance contracts. So the revenue models are strong. Why would they want to build gadgets which will have to be taken into villages and then it's a struggle to maintain these in villages and pulling them back, repairing them, sending them back. You won't care. It's not obviously profitable. So then who is an investor for such kinds of products? It's not a typical investor. It's somebody else. And there are, if you look at the medical companies in India, BPL was more into low-cost medical devices than some of the other bigger multinational companies. So there are. So how do you then get them interested in your product? And if your product's not interesting to anybody, despite the fact that it might be solving something, you have no way of getting it to market because you're not getting, going to get access to the finance to move on. Do you see that? So it becomes important early on that you talk a language with your problem definition, not to an engineering community. So it's not an engineering statement given to another engineer to double check to see if it's accurate or not. It's something that you give to a stakeholder and to an investor. Now, something else that I noticed in what you write, and that's typical for most of us who are not trained with good technical writing, is that our statements are very rambling. Our need definitions are not crisp statements. They're not precise statements. Okay? And quite often, there's a temptation, like happened with your pump a little early on, so I'll point to you again, of putting the solution into the problem statement. I'll give you one example for that, which happened to me. So I've been coordinating healthcare research on campus, and in doing so, I have to deal with hospitals in the Mumbai area. And various clinicians from the hospitals come and have conversations. And in having conversations, sometimes they come here, they come to my lab even. One such person who came to me was the head of the blood bank at Hinduja Hospital. Hinduja is one of the top hospitals in the city. He's the head of the blood bank. And he comes to me and he says, look, I think I found the right person. I want you to solve my problem. So what's your problem? The problem is you are aware that blood has different types. There's A, B, AB, and O. There are four types of blood groups. The blood bank is forced into keeping four types of blood on stock at all times. Right? It would be very nice if you could eliminate all of these and stock only O type blood. Why O? It can be universally given to, actually that's strictly speaking not true, but okay, whatever. There are subtypes which matter all, as well, yeah. But anyway, so O is more convenient to stop because then without worrying too much, especially in an emergency where there's a major blood loss, you can quickly. Now, this is also true for most people who have had problems, okay. You have had problems. 
you make the effort to ask what might be a solution. In the same way, this guy as the head of the blood bank, he has a problem stocking blood types. Some blood types are relatively rare. Right? So he's made the effort to figure out what might be a solution, and he realizes that this is in theory a feasible solution. So he says, look, there's a certain chemistry involved in what differentiates A from B to A B. And at the core of it, you've got blood cells, red blood cells. These are proteins on their surface. And these proteins in turn have, have sugars. And if you have sugars of different types, that's what differentiates A from B. A is a certain sugar type, B is a different sugar type. I'm simplifying, but you'll get the basic idea. If you have AB, you have both sugars. And if you have O, you lack both sugars, both types of sugars. So that's the simple chemical basis of what's going on. Now, how do the sugars get onto the protein? It turns out there are enzymes which added them on during the process of formation of the proteins and the blood cells themselves. So once upon a time, some catalysis happened, the sugars got placed on top of the proteins. But catalysis is reversible. If A goes to B, B can go to A. Okay. So in theory, the same catalyst can knock off the sugars if I change my process conditions towards that extreme. So I can push the reaction in the reverse direction. So therefore, he actually does that effort of figuring out which enzyme it is which does this. And he comes up with a simple idea. He says, look, can you make a cartridge reactor for me where I will inject one unit of type, let us say A blood and by the time it comes out, your enzyme inside here has knocked off all these sugars and therefore what comes out is effectively type O blood. Okay. So he has come with a problem definition. Now at this point, can you tell me what is wrong with it? It's actually a great problem definition for an engineer and that too it happens to be a, uh, a field of research of mine, so something I'd love to do. But as an innovation channel statement, what's wrong with this? And it's on the board. So. He put the solution, he put the solution inside his problem definition. What is the solution? cartridge reactor. So, he is looking at my lab and my lab, the name of the lab is protein engineering lab. He figures I know about proteins, I know about engineering, so therefore I should be able to build in this reactor. So, he asked me explicitly for this solution. Okay. But what is wrong with it? What he did not do is just tell me the need and then let me think about a way to solve it. This is like what happened to you when your guides gave you a thesis project to work on. Okay. What is the need? So now come back to it. What is the need? No. What is the need? Not convert it. Again, that he put in my mouth that he needed to convert A to O. What is the need? What is the problem he is having in the blood bank? Availability of all the blood. Availability of some types of blood. Some blood types are rare. Okay, there is by the way something also called the Bombay blood type, which even lacks other things. But it is reasonably common on the western coast, that is why it is called the Bombay blood type. Right? So, he did not tell me that. He did not tell me that for figure out a way to deal with a shortage of certain blood types. He told me figure out a way to convert blood from one type to another. And we went down that road. We actually did a project for that. And it was a wrong project. And we ended up in failure. We actually made that enzyme. We did figure out how to put together a system. But it is not cost effective at all. The enzyme is so expensive. And the conversions are inefficient. And you know what happens. If I do not fully convert A to 1, I inject it into somebody saying it is over. There is problems. So I need a huge amount of enzyme to guarantee conversion to even 99.99% conversion. And that's at this point impractical economics wise. But what was the crux of it? The crux of it was he gave me a problem definition which was something where he thought he had a solution and he somehow pushed it into the problem definition in the first place which pushed us onto the wrong track because at that point we didn't challenge him. 
He's the head of the blood bank. In theory, he knows what he's talking about, right? He didn't. What is the simplest solution? Can I get you guys to ideate? None of you are from the bio background here. So can you think of a better solution? So what is the need again? How do you make blood of a specific type accessible quickly on demand? Okay. So one immediate mistake is to see this problem through the specialization of somebody else. So the guy looked at my specialization and said that I am capable of dealing with that problem. What he didn't ask is what about people of other specializations of different backgrounds? How would different people with different skill sets like tackle the same problem? Maybe a better data management of the available blood groups which are connecting or together with Okay. So getting what do you mean by data management? Be more precise. Uh, how much blood, blood group of, uh, how much blood of uh, a particular blood group is in other hospitals? Is being stocked in the blood yeah, banks in other hospitals. Okay, but can you do better or more? Yes. So, and by the way, what technology does that involve? Does it involve chemical engineering? Does it involve biology? No. Logistics? Does it even, what is it? Which? If you were to try to find a student to crack this now, which skill set would you want in that student? Okay, programming. Okay, IT. Okay, what else? So now go down that line of thought. How else would you do this? That doesn't easily happen, right? Nobody updates all the time, in real time. So yes, but it can get done. But there are challenges with that. And by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, hospitals are not too happy to share their availability or non-availability to others. There are issues with that. In case, as a patient, you run away from this hospital because it never has that blood type. And you see, they don't want to lose customers. You have to deal with all that. So one of the issues here is notice that the moment you start proposing solutions, you start asking what's going to happen to each stakeholder in my system. Are they going to like my solution or are they not going to like my solution? Is it a threat to them or is it actually a solution? So later on when you learn about a stakeholder analysis, one of the questions to ask is how is your innovation going to change every stakeholder's outlook? Okay, but what else? How do I figure out? How do you figure out how to go from one end of Mumbai to another? And how would you actually move now? How do you travel? Look at the train. If you have to take a car, how do you go? Why? So what, what is it that those apps do, which is so great, that they figure out what your need is and satisfy that need. What is the need there? No, what is the need? That's the technology. What is the need? To pick you up. That's again getting a little more technical. Is to pick you up from a given coordinate. Okay, take that. To pick you up from a given coordinate and then drop you off at a given coordinate. More than that, no? more than that, at a reasonable rate, which may or may not be negotiated, agreed? <coughs> but that's what they achieve. So then what is the need? So again, try to again see the importance of this need statement. What is the need? The need is how to go from A to B at a reasonable cost and do so in a fashion that you're not ripped off once you reach B, not like your typical auto driver who then demands extra once he takes you somewhere. But you're pre-negotiating something. So tell me if you can negotiate a car journey from A to B, how come how come we can't negotiate a blood donation from somebody else? What technologies do you need if you wish to get access to somebody else's 
blood as a donated unit of blood. Need not even be donated by the way. You see that you can even pay somebody if they are willing to come to hospital for a given transaction. You see that? So if I keep track of a few rare groups, how do I keep track of people and a few rare groups? Get some plugin, some Facebook plugin, some plugin. You can keep track of people, you can keep track of their blood types, you can keep track of when they last donated, you can tr keep track of their current location. And of course, people can opt as to whether to give their location out or not give their location out. Maybe you don't want to others to know where you are at. Or, or you can have it confidential through some central server which then identifies people and then negotiates with them rather than you directly negotiating one on one. So it can be an anonymous negotiation. But you see that essentially I changed the whole tone of those discussion. There is no biology, there is no chemistry, there is no chemical engineering, there is no protein engineering, there is IT. Now would it work? Would it solve the problem? Potentially. Would it solve the problem more cheaply than my fancy reactor? Probably yes. That's the point. So the moment a solution gets embedded into a problem definition, you're probably already thinking down the wrong track. Now this is a bit of a challenge for us because we are all, if you look at yourselves, you've just gone through an education process where you specialized. And so there's always a temptation for us to fit our specialization into everything we do. If you are the robotics guy, everything that happens around you should now involve robotics. If you're an IT person, everything around you should involve IT. But if you stop and think about what I've said here, okay, you want to take a step back and ask what is it that genuinely needs to be done in terms of identifying a need and then what skill sets then potentially come into the solving of a need. So it's actually something that's broken up into two phases. So this statement at this point, all that I'm talking about is what's the need? And ideally, I don't even want to hear about a solution until everybody important to me clarifies that this is indeed the need. Because if not, I'm wasting my time. Okay? So figuring out what the need is, figuring out from a range of different stakeholders with different backgrounds that this is indeed a need. I don't want to listen to, for example, to only the, in hindsight, it was a mistake to talk to only the head of one blood bank. It's theoretically possible that even if I came up with my reactor system to convert A to O, that other blood banks might not have been able to use that technology because of lack, for example, of competence. Remember, at the end of the day, somebody, some technician has to take A, connect it, and you should get O out, and that O has to be stored in a bag. If they don't have competence to do that, what's the point of your technology? Right? So this was the best blood bank. So in some ways, there's a mistake of talking to the best case scenario person and trying to design a technology for that person. So how do you design it for a different context? How are we doing for time? Five. Five, okay. So what I really want you to focus on is all these things that you've talked as interests and we are curious to learn about your interests as we are going along. Try to refine these better and better as need state. They need not be things you have already started working on, but they are things that you are ambitious about. And you are quickly going to realize that the real world has many constraints on what you are going to be able to do. Right? So it is actually when many of you say that I would like to do this, I would like to solve that problem using this, you are actually reacting to the fact that you have access to X, Y, Z resources, usually those are limited. And therefore, if you want to solve a particular problem, you can only use XYZ. That's a starting thought process for most of us. But one of the things you'll appreciate as we go through some of the case studies going on in the Tata Center is that not strictly speaking true. One of the funny things you have learned in hindsight is that if you actually take on the real problem, the real need, sometimes there's more funding available to solve the real need than if you try to do that incremental research that a DST or an MHRD or a DVT gives you. It's important, therefore, to take time out to figure out the actual need. Some points in here, which a couple of points which I'll quickly go through. It's turned out to be important that we go out and talk to a bunch of people, but in this talking, ideally we are observing. 
Why? Because the more people talk and this happens in a situation if you think about it in healthcare for example, every doctor realizes that their system is inefficient. Every doctor has tried to figure out what's the solution to their problem, that one problem. Every doctor has a pet technology problem, something they want solved. And every doctor has made an effort to try to solve it, even if they don't have the training or the skills. The net result is again they will try to put some thought process in your head as to how you should attempt to solve their problem. And again you are biased, again the thought process is probably wrong. So what I have in particular learned is you let them talk but you filter it out. It's important that they talk because at the end of the day it's their problem and you are solving it ultimately to impact their ability to serve patients, right. But to the extent that you can observe, watch and definitely do not ask people what they want because then they will feed you the wrong thing, okay. It is very important for you to do this, document what you are saying very quickly, make notes. If you are going out to a hospital for example to an OPD ward, observe, make notes, come back. Elaborate on your notes, but these should be your observations, not somebody else's words that you are writing in your own hand, okay. Do this in different settings, for example, what you are going to see happening in a government hospital now in the monsoon is different from what you will see in winter, different sets of infections. If you go in at the wrong time, you will get the wrong impression of what is a critical problem and what is not, okay. So do it at different times and you have to be sensitive to the fact that you are typically dealing with people who are illiterate, which means there is a certain responsibility. That is why the word ethics is there. You just do not go into a place and ask people all kinds of things about their lives including for example their finances and their earning capability and so on because you can abuse that information and turn it against them. So there are increasingly standards now on how you will acquire data but also keep it safe and not abuse it even in your attempt to figure out what solving, okay. At the other extreme, I am going to just throw this thought which is that some people have preferred in history not to ask stakeholders anything because then you would have been pushed onto the wrong line of thought entirely. So Henry Ford's argument about the assembly line manufacture of autom of vehicles of cars. Okay, um, there is a certain structure to this and as we go along, as you give me your need definition, I will ask for more and more detail and I will ask you to fill out, okay, fill things out according to the structure. So, you keep seeing more and more of me and on Friday at the end of the workshop, we will we'll discuss some of your ideas in more detail. But I want you to spend some thought, you, you may get some of these wrong because you have clearly come into this without much planning of what you want to do, that is okay. Nothing happens immediately. But I am just throwing out there a set of, of terms of, of thoughts of processes that you need to start worrying about. Okay, you are going to work on things, but okay, start with therefore the problem definition and the significance as you see it. And the important thing is you are not going to freeze this, it is not like some thesis where one chapter is done. You are going to come back to each of these points again and again and again and you will keep revising them. Because chances are you are still getting it wrong, you know, after spending time thinking about it, okay. I am going to leave this thought here and stop with this. My entire focus has been on identifying a need and after that breaking it down into a set of technical challenges, problems, need problems, not solutions. I do not want to know a solution. For each of these technical challenges, in turn there might be 10 possible solutions, each. And the question of which one is the best one is a separate discussion. But until we are con convinced that we are working on the right technical challenges in the first place, there is no point talking solutions. So do not get into this thing where you are going to force fit what you are doing onto a problem. What you are doing can be done in your know, conventional research efforts anyway. But if you are talking about innovation, do not make a mistake of talking solutions at all. So I am not going to talk solutions till much later, okay. Maybe never in this workshop, after the workshop we will talk about potential solutions.
So I appreciate that there's a process where therefore in trying to figure out your need, you'll talk to a bunch of people, you'll try to refine a need statement, you'll probably do this iteratively as you talk to more and more people of different backgrounds preferably. <coughs> then you'll try to break it down into a bunch of problem statements of different kinds, engineering statements, finance related statements, marketing related issues, policy related issues maybe, I don't know, whatever it is in your domain, break it down into a bunch of small things. One advantage of breaking it down into small things is each can be easily managed. One student can take on this, another person can take on that and so on, that's why you break it down. Okay. After that is when you start talking solutions much later. Okay. So I'll stop here, it's time for questions, otherwise we can take it over lunch as well. Right. And I'll come back to this. So one of the one of the expectations is that if you can, you're pro probably all aware of what you keyed in on that Google form that you were given. We'll probably create another form and announce it, uh, announce the URL to you later in the day. And I want you to update your entries on the needs that you see relevant to those topics that you put up. And let's take it from there. Let's keep working on it. So there's always some homework that we'll have to do each evening. Okay. Thanks.